Good evening, everybody. My name is Marie Dorini. I'm the Associate Director of the Columbia Institute for Ideas and Imagination. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, it's a joint program between the Columbia Global Centers and the Institute. And I'd like to start by thanking everybody in both our teams at uh, um, the Global Centers, Reed Hall, and the Institute for organizing this event, and Geraldine Villain de Edition du Sous-Sol. It's been really wonderful doing this all together. Um, so I'm just going to briefly introduce Deborah, qu'on ne présente plus, uh, <laughs> who's a novelist, an essayist, a poet, a playwright. She's the author of eight novels, three of them uh, listed for the Man Booker Prize, three collections of short stories, radio plays, poetry, and she's re received, received numerous awards for her writing. Um, Deborah was part of the first cohort of the Institute for Ideas and Imagination in 2017 when, when we opened. And when she was a fellow, uh, she completed a novel, she worked on the third volume of her trilogy, and she engaged so deeply and enthusiastically with her fellow fellows that it's hard to keep track of all the things she got done while at Reed Hall. Deborah took the cross-disciplinary and innovative mission of the Institute very seriously, and one couldn't have hoped for a more engaging, curious, and experimental fellow, particularly in that first year. So when I read Real Estate, the last volume of what she calls her living autobiography, I felt I could go home and die. <laughs> we had made it. Reed Hall and the Institute appear in the book as one of the main characters, and in a very flattering light, and it must be added. And I must say, there are few honors in my life I like to brag more about than that one. So thank you, Deborah. <laughs> so we're here to celebrate the French uh, edition of The Living Autobiography, a trilogy for which she was awarded the Prix Femina, all brilliantly translated by Céline Leroy, beginning, in, beginning with the title, so Le Coup de la Vie, The Cost of Living, Ce que je ne veux pas savoir, Things I Don't Want to Know, and my personal favorite, état des lieux for real estate. And if you understand French, you just know that this is absolute genius. <laughs> um, Céline Leroy, who's here tonight, studied contemporary and American British literature at the Sorbonne. She holds a degree in literary translation. She's translated work by Rebecca Solnit, Maggie Nelson, Renata Adler, Rachel Cusk, Laura Kasich, Edmund White, Janet Winterson, Jane Smiley, amongst many distinguished writers. Tonight, Deborah and Céline will each read a passage of the trilogy, in English for Deborah, in French for Céline, and uh, then they'll have a conversation about translation and whatever else they want to talk about. Then Deborah will sign books over there. There's the Chan Library and the Red Wheelbarrow selling um, books, and you should obviously read them now, but you must then go back before Christmas and buy your Christmas special, which is this extraordinary box set for the, even if you don't read French, you have to buy it. It's just <laughs> beautiful. And it comes with a petit carnet that has poem, a, a new poem by Deborah and a little afterward by Deborah. So you really need this and your friends need this. So come back for Christmas shopping. Um, Deborah, your trilogy takes us from the garden shed to imagining your perfect house. And tonight it gives me great pleasure to welcome you and Céline back in another house, a very real house, and one that's very much yours, Reed Hall. Thank you. Bonsoir à tous. Um, thank you, Marie for your elan, your energy, your intelligence, and uh, for helping to make such a fruitful year when um, I was a fellow here at the Institute. Also to Eve and to James, and, um, and tonight to my brilliant French publishers, Sous Sol, to Adrien Bosque, to my editor, Marine Duvel, to uh, my publicist, Geraldine Gislain, and above all, to Céline Le Leroy. So Céline is my French voice um, across three books, um, and it's quite an emotional 
experience to be um, to be translated uh, across three books. One, you know, for the first is written in my 40s or about my 40s, the next 50s, and finally um, 60. And Celine has had to enter those those years, never mind the language, and um, to to write these books. The hardest thing was in English to find a voice, a voice that was intimate uh, with with readers, with you, and also formal, not too close, um, and to find a voice that was quite a lot like myself, but not quite myself, because there is the artifice of, of, of finding a, a voice, a tone, a cadence to steer three books. So it was hard <laughs> enough in English, and um, this was Celine's task in um, French. So what we've decided to do is I'm going to read um, the very first page of in English, things I don't want to know. In French, do you want a microphone? This Can you hear me? Yes. Ce que je ne veux pas savoir. Hi, everyone. So, a p political purpose. You are your life and nothing else. Jean-Paul Sartre from No Exit, 1944. That spring, when life was very hard and I was at war with my lot and simply couldn't see where there was to get to, I seemed to cry most on escalators at train stations. Going down them was fine, but there was something about standing still and being carried upwards that did it. From apparently nowhere, tears poured out of me and by the time I got to the top and felt the wind rushing in, it took all my effort to stop myself from sobbing. It was as if the momentum of the escalator carrying me forwards and upwards was a physical expression of a conversation I was having with myself. <coughs> Visée politique. Tu n'es rien d'autre que ta vie Jean-Paul Sartre, huis clos, 1944. Ce printemps-là, alors que ma vie était très compliquée, que je me rebellais contre mon sort et que je ne voyais tout bonnement, mais tout, bo tout bonnement pas vers quoi tendre, ce fut, semblait-il, sur les escalators de gare que je pleurais le plus souvent. La descente se passait bien, mais quelque chose dans mon immobilité et le mouvement ascendant provoquaient cette réaction. Comme surgit de nulle part, les lames coulaient de mon corps et le temps que j'arrive au sommet et sente le souffle du vent, je devais vraiment prendre sur moi pour arrêter de sangloter. À croire que la vitesse de l'escalator m'entraînant dans son ascension était l'expression physique d'une conversation que j'entretenais avec moi-même. It's so interesting, Celine, just to hear the difference in our speaking voices. Yeah, my raspy voice, um, that so doesn't help. <laughs> no, but it's interesting because we, we're, talking about, we're talking about voice. <coughs> yeah. Because I feel that Celine has absolutely got my voice in the books. And when we speak together, side by side, we can hear, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> we can hear they're very, very different, yeah. as they have to be. So here is just one passage from The Cost of Living in English and in French. <coughs> Le coût de la vie. Okay. I had watched an interview on television with a middle-aged Mexican woman who worked as a dishwasher in a casino in Vegas. She had raised seven children. Her son was serving in the Marines. She was speaking about fleeing to America when she was young. I was half listening, and then I was completely listening. Her words opened a space, a wide open space inside me. She said, I crossed the border alone, I came feeling the black and bluish darkness, the howling of the coyotes, the sound of the plants. When a woman has to find a new way of living and breaks from the societal story that has erased her name, 
She is expected to be viciously self-hating, crazed with suffering, tearful with remorse. These are the jewels reserved for her in patriarchy's crown, always there for the taking. There are plenty of tears, but it is better to walk through the black and bluish darkness than reach for those worthless jewels. La nuit précédente, j'avais regardé une interview télévisée d'une Mexicaine d'âge moyen qui était plongeuse dans un casino de Vegas. Elle avait élevé sept enfants, dont un fils qui était chez les Marines. Elle a raconté comment elle avait rejoint les États-Unis dans sa jeunesse. J'ai d'abord écouté d'une oreille, puis des deux. Ces mots ont ouvert un espace, un grand espace en moi. J'ai traversé la frontière seule. Je suis venue en sentant l'obscurité noire et bleutée, le hurlement, le hurlement des coyotes, le bruit des plantes. Quand une femme doit trouver une nouvelle façon de vivre et s'émancipe du récit sociétal qui a effacé son nom, on s'attend à ce qu'elle dé se déteste par-dessus tout, que la souffrance la rende folle, qu'elle pleure de remords. Ce sont les bijoux qui lui sont réservés sur la couronne du patriarcat, qui ne demandent qu'à être portés. Cela provoque beaucoup de larmes, mais mieux vaut marcher dans l'obscurité noire et bleutée que choisir ces bijoux de pacotille. And then just finally for the readings, and, and then I, I, I can sit down and we can talk. Um, I'm going to read a, a little bit from real estate, Etat de, de l'eau, uh, but we will read a little bit at the end. Yeah. So, so I'm just going to sort of give you the theme of that. So um, uh, real estate is about a very real longing and search for home and a house. And it asks the question, um, are they the same thing? Because there are plenty of women who have not felt at home in their own house. And um, I talk about Georgia O'Keeffe, the artist. There her, uh, there's an exhibition at the moment at Boberg, which I really recommend. Um, and I write a little bit about her here. She had found her final house in New Mexico a place to live and work at her own pace. As she insisted, it was something she had to have. I was also searching for a house in which I could live and work and make a world at my own pace. And even, but even in my imagination, this home was blurred, undefined, not real or not realistic or lacked realism. I yearned for a grand old house I had now added an oval fireplace to its architecture. So there's a lot of unreal estate going on in the subject of real estate. A pomegranate tree in the garden, a river, a rowing boat. It had fountains and wells, remarkable circular stairways, mosaic floors, traces of all the rituals of those who had lived there before me. That is to say, The house was lively. It had enjoyed a life. It was a loving house. In this sense, I owned some unreal estate. The odd thing was that every time I tried to see myself inside this grand old house, I felt sad. It was as if the search for home was the point, and now that I had acquired it and the chase was over, there were no more branches to put in the fire. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. So, C Céline, maybe just talk about, th that's the language. What <coughs> was it like to, to translate it? <coughs> it was very intense because I didn't have that much time to work on it um, because what happened maybe I could tell the story of how the, the books came to me the thing was that that had never happened to me actually in 20, 2018 uh, in the summer of 2018 I had heard a lot about these books and I was to be completely honest kind of getting tired of hearing about Deborah Levy everywhere <laughs> So I just, I, w I was going to some bookstore, English bookstore in Paris. I saw 
the first book, things I don't want to know, I say, oh, okay, I'll buy it, and then, you know, I can get it over with. And so I took it with me, not on really on holidays, because holidays for translators, that doesn't exist. So, but I was in the countryside working and reading, and I started reading that book. And, you know, it, it I had this feeling, you have the few times in your life, your reading experience, where I thought, oh, this is so familiar. I really feel for that book, and I cried. I really cried myself out, especially by the end of the book. And I laughed at the same time, which is also very rare, especially when you spend your life reading, basically. Um, you get kind of immune to some kind of humor, but this really worked on me. <laughs> and so um, I was extremely moved by that book on so many levels, of course, the the story, I was surprised on at every turn of that book. I never knew where it was going. It was a, a life story as, as I hardly read it. I'm, you know, French literature, auto fiction, we're very used to life stories. We've written life stories. And this was so different and so surprising, so fresh and so new. And of course, I was very extremely moved by the um, South African part of the story, your childhood. And also, I was very personally, physically uh, moved because of the voice story, uh, speaking, speaking up, speaking loud, as I myself had, I have voice problems, as you can hear. I uh, have a voc voc left voc vocal cord that is paralyzed, and so it's hard for me to be to speak loudly and I felt reading this even though that's not really the story but I felt that in a way translation is my way my own way to speak up and being the voice of some writers and who have very important things to say and share that with the French readers even though I cannot speak loudly and um, so it was extremely moving and I thought oh, I want to translate this but I'm very busy I don't have time and I thought of Les Editions du Sous-Sol um, but I, I didn't want to contact them because I was very busy sorry I'm a, I'm a bit long with this but <laughs> it's it's an important story I think and um, fast forward a year later uh, so I, do, I don't do anything about the book I just moved and thinking about it all the time and a year later, I'm in New York, um, in a literally staying in a cupboard in Chelsea, and spending my mornings uh, in coffee coffee shops working. And I receive an email by Marine Duval, um, the editor at uh, Les Editions du Sous-Sol. And she was telling me, oh, you know, I just bought two books by this amazing British author. Um, I don't know if you know her but she's, she, her name is Deborah Levy, and the books are Things I Don't Want to Know, The Cost of Living. I'm sure you would love them, and I would like you to translate them. So I almost fell off my chair and spilled my big chai latte, and um, I was trying to <coughs> you know, keep a straight face among all these lady people workers in leggings, uh, very New Yorkers kind of people working there. And um, that's that's how I th it happened. And so a lot of art is just chance, you know. That's yeah. a it's a strange the strangeness of, of of that encounter. And I think what you you picked up there was um uh, to do with voice for, mm. for people who haven't read it, read the first one is um as a child, um, I was more or less mute for, for about a year, not at home, but at school. And um, then one day, a teacher said to me, why don't you write down your thoughts? And I had a go, I did that. And I've discovered that my thoughts were quite loud. <laughs> and um, I th that was a sort of idea that was transmitted to you and your, in, you know, that's something that you connected with in your first read. And um, so there's a sort of mantra in the first book which goes like this. To become a writer, I had to learn to interrupt, to speak up, 
to speak louder and then a little louder and then just to speak in my own voice, which is not loud at all. And that was, th that's really at the core of, of the first book. And in the strange title, Things I Don't Want to Know, no one remembers it in English. They always say, oh, the blue book. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, what I don't want to know. Um, and I quite like that because the things we don't want to know are the things we know anyway, but repress. So, you know, it's, uh, it's Freud's idea that when you have a, a feeling of real uh, foreboding in your stomach that something bad is going to happen, it's already happened, which I find quite comforting, actually. So, so the things we don't want to know are the things we, we know are a little like a bill coming in through the post. You know what's inside it, and you're not going to open it yet. And this is the book that opens that envelope. Um, are there any things about the translation of the, of the, of the first book before we get on to um, the cost of living that mm -hmm. come to mind? Um. <coughs> what I felt was um, exactly the same thing as I, uh, I was feeling mm -hmm. while I was reading the book was it felt familiar. So it was, in a way, easy to translate, even when there are <coughs> a few technical things, problems. Uh, you ha I have to find solutions for, um, like, play on words, puns. You have these in the three books. But even though I only had a month, it felt very, I mean, I had a few difficulties with the first page because of the rhythm of that first page. It really sets the rhythm yeah. for me. Yeah. It's the escalators going up. And so I, I weirdly spend a lot of time on this first page, but it's like it put me on course for the rest of the book. And then it was almost easy. And I could I could work pretty fast. So so when you say familiar, what what does that mean? It's it's very hard to explain. <laughs> okay. It's just um, I don't know. Things come easily to you. Um, that's I'm not sure. And I I know from other um, colleagues that sometimes you know it's a. It resonates with you, yeah. and this you cannot really explain. But there's a way of writing, a rhythm, and also um, there is something that was extremely comfortable for me. And the very often the English speakers use repetitions very often, very easily. It that doesn't work in French, so we have to work around this and work with synonyms and do some acrobatics, and can be difficult but with you you exactly what you were saying there's a mantra throughout the book but there are you work also with repetition but in a very you weave that into the text it's not just repetition for the sake of repetition because you don't want to find a synonym it's just there for a purpose and one word repeated throughout the book leads to, to something else and then to something else so I just had to follow you actually mm. That's so true. It's, you see, I'm discovering a bit about how <laughs> I write um, from from Celine. So, so the repetition is there to, because it's, it's really there because you haven't, one hasn't quite nailed it. So you, so you, you you're just going for it again, <coughs> and in the edit, you'll decide how many, <laughs> yeah. how, how interesting that is, you know. So sometimes you just go for nailing at once. Yeah. Uh, and um, but, but this not, was a chase. May, it's not just like stuttering. No. It's just you need to nail it down. It, it's and it's when it has a, a resonance that mm. can be repeated uh, in, in the light of what's happened. And uh, it just adds meaning again. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's so interesting. I was talking to a um, a translator who has just finished a new French edition of Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. Oh. 
And she told me that uh, what was most difficult was in French, mm -hmm. um, never mind what a plunge, what a lark. Uh, what, what was most difficult was the um, he said, she said, he thought, mm -hmm. I thought. That, that this was the, the repetition <coughs> yeah. uh, slow in French was very much slower, yeah. whereas the pace, the energy of, of Mrs. D Dalloway mm -hmm. um, is, 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 is very hard to get yeah. in, in French. Interesting. Yeah, I, it's yeah. true that usually, I mean, not just for Virginia Woolf, but he said, she said in French, that's difficult. <laughs> yeah. Whatever the book, I wouldn't translate Virginia Woolf. I was <laughs> I always go to the official translations. So mm. because I find her I love her of course. I find her extremely difficult. Can't explain, but I always feel like I'm missing something. Yeah. That's so interesting. So the the writers that you just wouldn't you just wouldn't translate because yeah, maybe yeah. So it has to do also because, you know, I studied contemporary literature. I'm very much immersed in very contemporary writing, even though, mm. of course, I read the modern, the modernist writers and people from way back. But what I feel comfortable with is what's being written now and or, I mean, mm -hmm. in the 50s or 60s, that's still OK. <laughs> but. Before that, I wouldn't. Uh, there are too many things I don't. I don't know enough, I think, to really fully understand, and it would take too much time when there are so many great people who <laughs> know so many things are so knowledgeable. I like it that you translate contemporary writers. That you know, that's what mm. you, that's what you're good at. And yeah, that's what I've always that's known what that. you're <laughs> going to do. Okay, so, uh, so that's. That's the first one. Yes. And uh, so by this time, we you, you'd got kind of, you were on, uh, on your stride. Um, what, what about the cost of living? First <coughs> of all, to let's talk about the title, because it's the cost of life. Yes. In the, in the translation. Yeah. Um, that was the easy way out. Um, that was the most obvious thing, something that people could remember very easily, uh, because that's something we use, you know, not every day, but something we feel concerned about, <laughs> the cost of living, uh, le coût de la vie, and um, so that's how we came up with that. But yeah, the, the translation of the second book came four or five six months maybe after the first one so I still had in mind you know what I, w what had I had been doing with the first and I was happy to go back to it and then but move on to another stage of your life too. You were talking about translation as a kind of performance. Yes huh. <laughs> and finally I have a stage. <laughs> now the thing is uh, what I tried to explain translation to people because usually they just think we're a technician and we, we just work with uh, our computers. We put the, the original text in computer and wait for something to happen and um, some software for to, to do the work for us. And of course, that's not it. And to me, translation is an art and it's part of, and I didn't invent that. This is Edith Grossman, who said that. She's a very famous American translator from Spanish. She did this ama amazing translation from Don Quixote, the Golden Age, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And um, she said, we are part of the interpretative arts. We do interpretation. The only difference is that our performance is in front of the computer. We don't have a stage, but the job, the work we do, the, the way we process the things, the texts, is exactly how musician, classical, classical musicians work, actors, uh, theater actors work. And very recently, because I had missed the theater so much, I've been watching and listening to a lot of interviews by theater actors. And at some point, there was this young guy working at 
part of the La Comédie Française, and he was talking about this uh, Jean-Luc Lagarde's uh, play, and the way he was describing how he worked, and he unpacked the text so that he could be the actor of this part of this thing, I felt like he was talking about translation. And, but, so we, we have text, we interpret it, put it into French, but it's state text. So that's why I think people have sometimes a hard time understanding because an actor has text, but he's on a stage and he uses his body on a stage. A musician has a sheet of music and he's got an instrument and you can hear it. For us, we're in front of a computer and then we're invisible and people buy the book and so they just think of the, the original writer and they don't, which is pretty normal, I understand that. They just forget that they, don't, they can't imagine what it's like for us. So we, there is a performance and translation for me and I know it's the same for my colleagues because we always talk about that. It's also very physical. And in, in what sense? In the sense that, for example, um, I have one of my author writes a lot about fly fishing, and I have to become a fly fishing expert. <laughs> and I am not a fly, fi a fly fishing expert, of course, but I have to put my body in the situation the, the author describing. I have to know what fly fishing is. I have to know how body moves when it's in a river and it's casting the line and how the line reacts to the fish and I have to understand how the, the bodies of the characters work. Where the, the, <coughs> the, the character is in a plane, how I, I, I know, I have to know, understand and feel it in my body, how it feels like to be in a 1954 Cessna, etc., etc. So, um, uh, yeah, we have to embody what's going on on the page, and mm. it that's Which the writer has to do, obviously, as well. Sorry. So, 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 so you know, there's a, there's a sort of there's a double dance going on because yeah. the 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 first text, the primary text, mm. the um, the text that I'm laying down, that's also a performance of kind yeah. of a kind. Um, one of the one of the interesting things about the the first wave of the pandemic was that a lot of writers I knew were um, said, "Oh, this is just how life is anyway. We we're alone and, and at home, and we we I've I've just finished five novels, you know, kind of thing." And I, I found that very difficult to write, just like three sentences actually, in uh, <laughs> in the in the very beginning of the pandemic. I mean, I had to get over it because it was going to last uh, a year and a half and onwards. But the reason for that is um, something very hard to explain because when you write, you kind of transmit something to the world to know what it is. It's a thought, it's an action. It's a sort of transmission and the world gives you something back. And what was coming back to me was that the world was a global sanatorium. And um, the sound of the, I lived in London between two hospitals. So the soundtrack were of ambulances mm -hmm. going up and down. And I thought, well, I don't know what a writer does with this. Uh, never mind what you do with it as a human being and as a member of a community. You know, you go out and you shop mm -hmm. for other people in your apartment and things, are things in, that, in that sense sort of fall into place. And I began to understand in the endless interviews that we were required to do, oh, what has the pandemic taught you? But we were in it. You know, we, we, we were processing it. We still are. Um, I had no idea what to do with it. But interestingly now, I'm writing a no I'm now writing a novel. I've ended the trilogy. And um, I sort of know what to do with it. Um, which means that, which means to me, the world is sort of waking up and um, is, I'm transmitting something and it's transmitting something, um, you know, b back to me. We all 
are in this in this sort of very new space, having gone through something quite big together. Um, okay, so then shall we wrap up with real estate? Yeah, sure. Um, okay. One of the um, themes in r in English and real estate is of literature itself being a home. So as, as a young woman, you know, reading, reading was, um, literature was um, just a mansion for me. Um, and particularly, strangely enough, given how mauvais my French is, French literature, I read it in translation um, as a teenager because the librarian at my school, who was Irish, loved French literature. So I really cut my teeth as a writer on um, Marguerite Duras, on Jeannet, on Camus, on Balzac, on Flaubert, and Irish writers, um, you know, of obviously Joyce and Beckett, but l lesser known writers uh, for my generation at that time, like Sean O'Casey, who was a playwright. And um, so in a way, given that writers are also, you, you sort of work with the work that formed you. Mm -hmm. I, there's a, some deeper translation going on because mm -hmm. in this kind of modernist spare style, mm -hmm. it really came from, <laughs> from that French reading in the first place. Um, so I'm, I'm just going starting here at a literary festival. Uh, the narrator, as I sometimes call her, she's she's quite like myself um, is um, uh, is talking about is talking to an audience in Mumbai in India I suppose that my literary purpose was to think freely or rather for the books to speak freely on my behalf. If this sounds easy and obvious, it is not easy, not on the page or on life. Some people feel crazy when they try to deal with two contradictory thoughts at the same time, as if they fear they have done something wrong and need to purge the intruding thought before it muddies the water. The point of thinking is that it will always muddy the water. So, how do we live with our free thoughts and the mud? In Western European realist fiction, what is a writer going to do, we wondered out loud, with the irrational, with synchronicities, with superstition, and the private magic we invent to keep us out of harm's way, with the uncanny, with thought streams and digressions, that contradict our attempt to fix a story? Can we accept that language is sacred and scared, and it's scarred as well, because that's how we all are? I read to them a quote from Marguerite Duras, and this is Duras. I think that what I blame books for in general is that they are not free. One can see it in the writing. They are fabricated, organized, regulated. One could say they conform. A function of the revision that the writer often wants to impose on himself. At that moment, the writer becomes his own cop by being concerned with good form, in other words, with the most banal form, the clearest and most inoffensive. There are still dead generations that produce prim books, even young people, charming books, without extension, without darkness, without silence, in other words, without a true author. So I read that out, and that kind of opened up a whole sort of furious debate. We talked about how most literature, like life, is about how to have less and how to have more. Some people need to suffer less, and some people need to suffer more. All the people we care about need to suffer less. 
everyone is powerful when they feel heard and seen. It is a struggle to get anywhere near being heard and seen. So what does a writer do about that? If she invents stories in which her protagonists are seen and heard, does that feel true? The questions then steer towards my novel, Swimming Home. We talked about the ways in which a powerful person can be vulnerable and a fragile person immensely powerful and how a writer builds for her readers a trail of breadcrumbs in the forest. Perhaps another word for this is story with all its interconnecting backstories, which might be another word for histories. We know the birds can swoop down any time and devour the trail, but we are wired to want to find our way home. After all, to be lost with want without wanting to be found is to be in a place of deep sorrow. So I didn't want to end my book in that place. I wanted to end my book with the conceptual idea that I'm holding my real estate quite literally in my hand and that my books are my properties. And I write this. I own the books that I have written and bequeath the royalties to my daughters. In this sense, my books are my real estate. They are not private property. There are no fierce dogs or security guards at the gate and there are no signs forbidding anyone to dive, splash, kiss, fail, feel fury or fear, or be tender or tearful, to fall in love with the wrong person, go mad, become famous, or play on the grass. Je, je possède les livres que j'ai écrits et transmets mes droits d'auteur à mes filles. En ce sens, mes livres sont ma propriété. Une propriété qui n'est pas privée. Il n'y a ni chien méchant, ni vigile à l'entrée, ni panneau qui interdit aux gens, quels qu'ils soient, de plonger, d'éclabousser, de s'embrasser, d'échouer, d'être furieux ou effrayé, d'être tendre ou triste, de tomber amoureux de la mauvaise personne, de sombrer dans la folie, de devenir célèbre ou de jouer dans l'herbe. Merci, Céline Roy. Merci, Deborah.